Hello, everyone. Welcome to this special occasion with Thomas Hubel and Dr. Gabor Mate on relational attunement. We're excited that so many of you are joining us to celebrate the publication of Thomas's new book, Attuned, Practicing Interdependence to Heal Our Trauma and Our World. My name is Digo, your host for today. A few quick technical details before we get started today. Closed captions are available. For those of you joining us on Zoom, you can turn on closed captions by clicking the CC button found at the bottom of your Zoom window. And if you don't see it, click more, and then you'll find that CC button there. If you're finding us on YouTube, welcome. And just to know that on YouTube, closed captions cannot be turned off. If you have any technical issues or questions, please email our support team at online course support at thomasubel.com. The support team is available now to answer your questions. Those of you who are here with us on Zoom can submit written questions at any time by clicking on the Q&A button found at the bottom of your Zoom window. Again, if you don't see it, click more, and then you'll find the Q&A button there. I would love to first introduce Thomas. For those of you who are new to his work, here's a brief introduction. Thomas Hubel is a teacher, author, and international facilitator who works within the complexities of systems and cultural change, integrating the core insights of the great wisdom traditions and mysticism with the discoveries of science. He has led large-scale events and courses on healing collective trauma. Thomas is the author of two books, Healing Collective Trauma, a process for integrating our intergenerational and cultural wounds. And as of today, congratulations, he is the author of the new book, Attuned, Practicing Interdependence to Heal Our Trauma and Our World. At any time, you can find out more and order a copy of the new book, by visiting the webpage attunedbook.com. And a warm welcome again to you and congratulations, Thomas. Thank you, thank you. Yes. I'm also delighted to introduce our guest, Dr. Gabor Mate. For those of you who are new to Dr. Gabor Mate, he's a retired physician, an internationally published author of five books, and translated over 35 languages, including the award-winning bestseller, In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, Close Encounters with Addiction, and his latest international bestseller, The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. He is a recipient of his country's highest civilian honor, the Order of Canada, for his groundbreaking work on the links between trauma, addiction, and social issues. A film based on his work, The Wisdom of Trauma, has been viewed by over 10 million people internationally and has been translated into 20 languages. Gabor, welcome. Happy to have you. Thank you. It's nice to be here. And Thomas, you may not know this, but my book, The Myth of Normal, was published exactly a week ago, sorry, a year ago this week on September the 13th. So happy oh, birthday to you and uh, happy one, happy first birthday to you or happy birthday to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gabor. It's amazing, fantastic. And good to yeah. see you. Love to see you. You too, you too. And I spent the last couple of days hanging out with your book, refreshing my acquaintance with your wonderful book. So it's a great pleasure to speak with you. Oh, fantastic. Great. Yeah, I'm looking forward to Thanks, Gabor. And Thomas, we'd love for you to take some time and read two short excerpts from your book now as a jumping off point for the conversation. Yes, thank you, Digo, and welcome everybody that's tuning in right now with us here. I'm happy to have this conversation with you, Gabor, and I'm happy that we 
uh, speak about the attunement, individual and collective issues today, and and anything yeah, you you felt inspired by reading the book. And I will just read some short um, uh, blurbs from the book or short paragraphs. One is. Um, Every person we meet is a particular movement or arrangement of energy, like a piece of music. Only through deep listening, by tuning and receiving, can we adjust to this, can we adjust the speed of our movement in order to meet and receive the other deeply and well. And the second one is being truly present with another person is amongst the most precious gifts you can offer. After just a short time together, this way your friend will start to feel a little more grounded and relaxed too. Your grounded and relaxed nervous system has a co-regulatory function for their nervous system. By consciously choosing to stay open and connected to what you're feeling or sensing, you provide an unspoken, but very real support for others who are connecting with you. So Gabor, when I'm sitting here with you and I feel you and we are in a way attuning to each other that creates always, at least in my experience, it always creates a beautiful space and it creates an emergent space, a very creative space. It inspires me every time we have a conversation and I walk away with some gleaming neurons, how I tend to call it. And so thank you, first of all, for joining me here today. And um, maybe maybe you wanna jump in and, and see how this, maybe these two short paragraphs or attunement speak to you and your work, I know it's- Yeah, well, um, I mean, we both in our respective books emphasize uh, two things. One is the, um, um, the beautiful conjunction of traditional um, um, spiritual practices and modern science. So maybe I'll get you to say something about that. But before I do, um, I, in speaking of attunement, um, I want you to ask you about your beautiful concept of transparent communication. Mm -hmm. Because Usually when we talk about communication, we talk about an exchange between two people, uh, perhaps an exchange of information, which can, can sometimes be frustrating, sometimes be beautiful, but it's two entities conveying to each other what they have to say. Your concept of transparent communication requires, I think, or, or invites, an awareness of who I am and what's happening for me as I communicated with you. So it's not just about what I'm communicating and what I want you to understand or what I'm hoping to understand from you. It's also about my experience of communicating with you as it's unfolding. If I understood that right, uh, maybe you could talk about what you mean by transparent communication, which you Still here with you, Thomas. Okay, so that's good to know. That's a good piece <laughs> of communication. Um, yeah, Gabor, I lost you just for a moment. You froze, so maybe I as heard soon as you were asking the question. Yeah. yeah Wait a minute. You. You're the one that froze. I was speaking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, just transparent communication and how it involves not just the exchange of information but actually an experience of self in communication. Hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. It's exactly how you said it. It's not just that we convey uh, information in between two viewpoints, but it's, it's our capacity to deepen our experience of ourselves because without being attuned to ourselves, there's no way that we can be sufficiently attuned to each other. So it needs my embodiment, my emotional richness, my mental resonance with your intellectual capacity, but, and maybe also my spiritual or ancestral line, however much we want to open the space. And, and it also includes the space in between us 
because I believe the space in between us is not only air or distance, it's actually filled with information, very important relational information. And that emotions or the content that we uh, communicate also lives in the space in between us. And then my awareness of you and my awareness of your body, your emotions, your inner experience. And I think the whole thing, I think, is communication, not just what I want to say. And, and, and I think that level of attunement or transparent communication enriches and deepens our experience of one another. And also the, the togetherness. I had just a, before a lovely conversation with Dan Siegel, who extends his greetings to you. Uh, and, and we talked about interconnectedness and, and like a deeper level of awareness of oneself, life and each other. And I think that's very resonant. It's um, like, that's what I mean also with transparent communication, right? To keep it brief, maybe. And, and you give a interesting example of a, a child that you were sitting with who was very upset and uh, about something difficult that had happened to them some days earlier and and you describe your experience of of listening to the child and and how your experience of listening then has an impact on his own sense of himself in that moment so maybe you could maybe you could give that example as a practical illustration of what we're talking about yeah, it was a, a small child that fell off the table and then there was a lot of shock and frozenness in the nervous system of the child and it was very upset as you said and then i was just i was just sitting and attuning to the nervous system and feeling the child and the parents were also there but we were and it was a very quiet process but in the in the deepening of our connection and the resonance, also me allowing myself to feel the shock in the system, to feel the fear, to feel the freeze. So when I allow my nervous system to really feel that and also feel the pain that it created, you could see minute by minute how the child started to relax, how the child started to become more lively and, and more connected to the body, like as if the whole nervous system grounded itself and then and then the more the grounding came confidence curiosity came back and the, and the shock turned into a digestion process and that turned into relationality and that turned into curiosity and creativity and then the child wanted to play again and i think that that kind of attuned relationship is very powerful. And I think we can practice basically all the time in life when we meet people, when we work in organizations, when we, or of, of course, everybody who works as a therapist or any kind of healthcare provider or any parent, any, anybody basically. So that, that brings up, I think, two or three questions right away. First of all, can you say more about when you're experiencing the child's pain and fear and shock, what are you aware of you in your own body? Because you're not sensing the child's experience. So what's happening for you inside your body? Right. So, of course, I feel, I feel that I can hold a bigger spacious perspective. It's not that yeah. I'm getting shocked, as you said. It's yeah. like there yeah. is a bigger spaciousness in me that is calm, that is open, that is present. And then... But then it also needs, I can't just try to be with the child and not feel the child's inner world. So mm -hmm. like by allowing myself to get a, a kind of an impression of the shock and the freeze and the breathing that got stopped and the, maybe the pain in the body from falling, my nervous system is, I often say it's like when you connect two computers and, and you mirror the screen of one computer on the other computer. And that's basically what I'm doing in the human process, also in trauma processes. So that, but I allow myself to feel the stress, to feel deeply and not stay distant. And yeah. at the same time, holding a bigger awareness of the entire process. And so where my nervous system is open and fluid, 
I can go deeply into the place, but it doesn't mean once that ends, that process ends, it doesn't stay in me. And then I feel bad because many people say, oh, but then I feel all the time bad. And no, because it flows through me. And when it's, when it's done, it's done. So then my nervous system is again, open and joyful or whatever, energized. Which brings me to my next question. Um, still related to that same example. Um, boy, I could talk to you for a whole day here. I can see that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yesterday I was in, I'm back in Vancouver, not where I live, but yesterday I was in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada, um, speaking to a thousand indigenous people who have been severely traumatized over generations. We can talk more about that later. Mm -hmm. But somewhere in your book, you raise this question that a lot of people often ask you, and they ask me as well, is that how do you hold on to yourself or how you're going to get overwhelmed by the collective trauma that both you and I work with sometimes. And I really like your answer uh, because it's sort of, not sort of, it's exactly what I've come to understand myself. So that it's not automatic that we need to be overwhelmed by other people's pain and other people's traumas. And if you are overwhelmed, you suggest, and I agree, that it's because this unresolved stuff in ourselves that's getting um, evoked here. That's my understanding of how you see it. Can you say something about that? Yeah, it's because, beautiful. Because in the therapy world, it's just a huge question that comes up all the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's interesting you're bringing this up because I'm also working with a lot of therapists on their on supervision questions and that comes up all the time. So like yeah. I walk away and I feel <clears throat> disturbed is one thing yeah. or I, I got stuck with a client in a process and then, and then it seems like that that's something that shouldn't happen versus when that happens, the importance is what do I do with it? And if I yeah. take it to a supervision, then I bring it into a space that can help me to resolve what I cannot feel. And then yeah. the, the, the system, client and therapist grow together. Yeah. And so that's actually a beautiful process. And the same is, I think, true for collective dimensions. I know when the more, I don't know in how long I'm doing this now, 30 more years, that the more I clear my system, every time I feel there's a residue and I'm very committed to that so that I can. So the, in more and more situations, I don't, I feel the pain. I can go deeply into the experience, but it's not that I'm suffering from, I'm not suffering. It's a, it's a deeper embrace of that process. And so, as you said, I think it's, like it shows us that there are resonances in our field and because some people interpret this oh i sat with that person and now i carry the person's energy inside and i would say no like you feel a resonance of that person's inner world in your own inner world and it gives you a chance to grow and become wiser and more open and then you can relate to more of the world in a fluid way so it's always an invitation to grow and i think that's amazing absolutely and uh in the course that I teach, Compassionate Inquiry, I always tell my students, uh, therapists and so on, that whenever there's tension inside you, it requires attention. So tension always requires attention. That's beautiful. And, yeah. yeah. And, and when you're working with somebody, whether it's a group or, or individual, and if you're feeling overwhelmed, you're feeling tense, you're feeling pain, so it's yours. And it requires your attention. And it's a good opportunity to to grow, which leads me to my um, next point. You use this, um, I think you use the phrase social mysticism, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, so that <clears throat> very early in the book, in the introduction, you, you, you say that a lot of the issues that we face in our world are not just social, economic, political, historical, but they're also spiritual. Mm -hmm. and, and then later on in the book, you propose that mysticism, and actually I'll get you to maybe even explain what you mean by mysticism, is one of these words that we all use, but we all might have different connotations. But you talk about social mysticism, which means that the, as I understand it, is that the experience of unity and, and connection doesn't just belong on a meditation cushion or in an ashram or a monastery or a mosque or a synagogue or a church. 
it actually is something we can practice and bring into the world so that daily experience can actually support our striving or our, our spiritual growth. And so I thought social mysticism, I'd not seen that phrase that way before. I'd love you to talk about it. Mm. Yeah, basically, I think on, on many things, we are so aligned and resonating with each other. So that's exactly the way you framed it is in a way I would also frame it that yeah. that, that our <clears throat> daily life and our relationships can be or I think for many of us are the chance to be our meditation. Like if you go to, I don't know, a Tibetan cave and you have a 10 year retreat and you're yeah. sitting, except you're your teacher from time to time, you don't see anybody. I mean, that's a form of spirituality. But for yeah. most of us listening here, most probably now and being here in this room, uh, that's not what we chose. And that's why when we, when we live in culture, we have it in some ways similar, but in some ways also very different practice that we can be in the cultural forces in the daily life, that we can be parents, lovers, that we can be socially impactful. And all of this requires that our life becomes our spiritual practice and our daily relationships. And that's why attunement to anything, to other people, to nature, to the planet, to um, any kind of sentient beings, to situations, to the future, the future generations, our ancestors, anything can become part of our human practice. And this means we become able to resonate with. And I think that's how we become responsible, like able to respond to all this amazing uh, life that we are living and living in as a living process and so yeah relational mysticism because mysticism is the core of all the big traditions that's where the real states the deeper insights of consciousness happen that's where deeper states are being touched that's where the invisible becomes accessible and that's also where the word because many people can talk about spiritual states because they read it somewhere it makes sense to them intellectually it's like but when the person doesn't rest in that state, the word and the energy are not the same. And the whole spiritual texts are about how the word and the energy become again, not two. And when it's not two, then it's true. If it's, yeah. if it's two, then it's intellectually true, but the state doesn't support our insight. So that's why the humility, I think, on the spiritual path is very important that we speak from our experience more than about all the concepts that somebody said somewhere and most probably when they were in the state it was true for them but it doesn't mean it's true when i just repeat the phrase you know um i've often said people often ask me what my spiritual path was and uh i, I have to confess or not oh, confess it's not a confession it's i'm just saying um i've not had much of a disciplined spiritual practice in my life um, unlike you and unlike others that many other a friend of mine goes and sits in vipassana meditation silently for 40 days i mean for me four minutes is a challenge you know but uh, <laughs> but recently i did begin you know and thank god but i've always said that my most important spiritual work is actually in my marriage relationship mm. um because that's where we get into the shadow that you talk about and that's what we need to strive to get into the presence. Um, in terms of word mattering, I, I'm going to show you something. This is a, a bracelet that I was given last week. I was up in Haida Gwaii, which is a group of islands in British Columbia where the totem poles come from. And those people are severely traumatized. I, mean, I can't even tell you the degree of collective trauma up there. But they gave me this bracelet at the end of this workshop, and they... The meaning is these words matter. And I'm so happy to wear that because I'm actually realizing all words matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've also been reading more about the Eightfold Noble Path of Buddhism that I know you're well familiar with. I mean, they talk about right speech, which also includes right listening because you can't speak on you listen, which takes us back to attunement. And um, you quote Dan Siegel, I think, at some point about how 
attunement is being aware of your inner space, but attunement with another's is being aware of their internal experience. And um, that's so difficult. Now, why is that so difficult to us? And then the words that we speak from that state of lack of attunement are going to be missing the point. They're going to be missing the mark. So why is attunement so difficult for all of us? Yeah, you described it again very beautifully. Like, I think we all know these moments when we are more attuned, most probably, and we all yeah. know the moments when we're not. Yeah. And when we're saying things that are actually painful yeah. of missing the point, as you said, re-traumatizing sometimes. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's also the point that many of us, like we are deeply social uh, beings. And when we grow up and we don't have certain environments that support some of those, func those functions, so our, our relational capacities get hurt or we need to defend ourselves to shut down part of the overwhelm, which in itself is an intelligent process. So our yeah. defense mechanisms are deeply intelligent because this is the best I could do for myself in that moment. And then yeah. later on as grown-ups, we look at this and we, we say we pathologize it, but actually reframing those as intelligent functions at that time and then finding access to my own intelligence that created that so is also part of the healing and and i think since we all um, you know most probably all of us have been born into a traumatized world it was already traumatized before we were born or conceived like we live in the distortion and i think you also beautifully write in your book the myth of normal how we are living in a system like that has already this kind of massive trauma distortion from colonialism over racism over holocaust over gender violence and many other wounds that i think we got so adjusted to that like scar tissue that we grew up in often so then and that relational inability is is a, is one of the symptoms and that's why also i often say also when we struggle with it there is something important to us because we struggle with it otherwise we wouldn't be struggling because it would just give up but we don't so something is important in relating and that what is important is the part of us that is relational and wants to heal itself and and so I think, yeah, including the dimension of trauma in in the relational capacity building and saying not just I can't, for example, people can say, oh, I can't feel my body well, but I could also say as a two-year-old, when I needed to be hospitalized alone, I managed to shut down part of my body sensations because it was simply too overwhelming for me. So I can say it's a dysfunction. I can also say it's a function that made sense and, and saved me. And I relate very differently and with curiosity to intelligence versus a dysfunction that I want to get rid of. And yeah, so this is just a short. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, <clears throat> you, you talk about trauma and I talk about trauma. And um, I think we both owe this to Peter Levine as, as something not that um, happens to us, but happens inside of us as a result of what happens to us. You made that point very clearly in, in this book, Attuned, as, as I do in The Myth of Normal. And Peter Levine says, um, and I think he's the source, um, um, he says, trauma is not so much what happened to us, but rather what we hold inside in the absence of an empathetic, mutually connected witness. So that what you describe when you talked about being a two-year-old hospitalized, was that your own experience or was it just a theoretical example? No, it's my own experience. No, right? that, that's what happened to you. Okay. The, the trauma, the, the protection of disconnection that you um, practice, there was wisdom in it. That's why the film is called The Wisdom of Trauma. You know, there's a wisdom in it. Um, but it would not have been necessary had there been adults there who could attune with you exactly so that it's not trauma is not the absence of hurt it's the um presence of hurt when you're all alone with it exactly, exactly. and so exactly. i think that the, 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 your whole concept of um, transparent communication is actually 
I imagine consciously designed or maybe it evolved that way for you. I, you know, that's for you to tell me as a way of, of, of healing that trauma of not being attuned with in the first place. Exactly. Exactly. I know. I completely agree with you. And, uh, and, and, and I think also in doing my own work over decades, it, it's, like what happened to me also turned into a gift. That's also amazing. Mm. Like that, that mm. when we really tend to it and when we invest the energy to really go deep into the source, like when, where it's really, well, not the symptoms, but the, the, the deeper root of the symptoms, yeah. I find, and I also see this in many people that I work with, that how slowly the trauma turns into their gift and, and we all become remedies. That's amazing. We all become, in a way, psychoactive substances when we are, <laughs> uh, when we heal our trauma, we become active in the collective field as a remedy. And yeah. I, I think that's really magical. That's really like post traumatic learning is we, we are not going, we are not integrating trauma to go back to who we were before. We are going actually forward into someone that exactly. we don't know. So we don't yeah. know who we become. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, for me, for me, resilience is not just bouncing back to the original. It's actually being able to grow uh, from what happened. Um, let me jump to something maybe related, but just something that I need to understand better uh, in your book, okay? Um, which is you talk about towards the end of healing on the individual processing level of trauma. You talk about on the collective level. I'll have a question about that for you in a minute. But then you also talk about ancestor on the ancestral level. And that's the part. And, and, and you talk about it not as an intellectual concept, but as actually a, an inner knowing. Um, now, in Canada, it's remarkable. The indigenous people, they're so connected to their ancestors. As wounded as they, were, as they are, and, and the anguish here is unfathomable. But the ancestral connection is just so present for them. For me, it isn't. So, and a and, and number of times in the book, you make the, connect, the distinction between knowing something intellectually and knowing it um, experientially. Um, in the Western world, we're so addicted to intellectual knowledge, but this deeper knowledge is very often ignored. So first of all, I'm going to ask you two questions here. One is, just talk a little bit more about this inner knowing and distinguish it for us from the intellectual understanding, number one. And number two, then, talk to me more about ancestral healing, because that is just something, I read your section on it and I read your recommendations for it, but for me, it just doesn't connect. You know, I'm not making it wrong, I'm just saying, for me, there's just something not there that I, I can connect with. So, A, inner knowing, and B, ancestral, okay. on a knowing level, okay? Yeah, fantastic. Teach, yeah. Me, teach, me, teach, teach me something here. Okay, I'll, I'll have a look. So, the first is that, as you said, like, of course, I can make a research and get my genealogy together and I can look at my family tree and do all the research who were my parents, grandparents, great grandparents, whatever. So that's the intellectual part. And, and maybe that's also helpful for some people to have an intellectual anchor. But when we do in our workshops, when we look at our courses, when we look at ancestral healing, we always say, okay, the body, because I believe that our nervous system is not just an individual nervous system. It's, a, it's individual, it's ancestral, it's collective, it's all of it. And there's different access routes to different parts of our nervous. When I do collective sensing, I, I use the collective part of my nervous system. So I'm not just encoded as Thomas, that's part of the library, but that's not the whole library. And, and so my body is... And my nervous system is, I can go to my personal development, but I can also go to my ancestors via my body. And then, and I think that also relates to your question, because I think, first of all, like if there is a strong cultural support, like in the native populations you talked about, there's a, a strong cultural support to keep that breathing and open 
and and it, there is a value attached to it that is very high so that kind of energizes that part of the nervous system in the in the ecosystem naturally so it stays more open it's like somebody shows us the manual and says okay that's the manual to your nervous system so we are all aware of it so we all know those functions but yeah. in in the western cultures often that manual is not provide it easily so we either we go to search for it with google as long as it's needed until we find it and we find somebody that teaches us or we don't and the second part is that numbing is very important as, as you know but i'm saying this for all of us now that like numbing mm. is such an important function so not feeling something in, on the level where the not feeling happens is more important than feeling something. So, yeah. so that might be that maybe early disconnect, like for, for infants or children, very young children, a disconnect from the parents might need to shut down a part that the numbing is more important than the knowing. Yeah. So, and, and I think sometimes when we go in and we wanna connect, the, sometimes the channel is uh, kind of shut down and then working and letting the shutdown in a relational space resonate slowly opens it up so that the deeper connection to the ancestral nervous system can open up. But if there is a, a, a wound of separation, so then the numbing actually makes a lot of sense. And yeah. so then we can say either, or oh, I cannot connect. We can also say, I managed to shut down the connection because right. that was better for me than to keep it open. Yeah. And, and maybe there is something there. I, I don't know, we would need, need a longer conversation, but I think that's what I would follow and, and see if there is any, any part of the nervous system that needs that numbing. And if it's being seen, maybe then it will naturally open up into a deeper place. That would be a bit my hunch or my direction that I would go into. But I think then, then uh, and then the, the, the connection is a felt connection. And when we trust, when I tune, when I call on, I would say in, in our work, we often start what we call gates in the ancestral work. So we say, okay, who is the ancestor that is the most resourced for you? Like it was your grandmother that was the closest to you. It was your grandfather where you have, where, where is the most open gate? And I start with that ancestor to listen into the relationship, feel the relationship and then feel the ancestor. And, and ask that ancestor to help me to open up the space to the other ancestors. And so mm -hmm. that I, I get some allyship in my own ancestry to mm -hmm. wake up that part of my nervous system where it's easy, not where it's hard. And then mm -hmm. to use that kind of de-iced pond to go deeper into the water and explore the water more and so i have immediately a resource that i can connect to i mean for some people that doesn't exist so then the resource needs to be like a well-trained therapist or like somebody like yourself who has a lot of experience to work with trauma but then that's the resource here to help us to open up the spaces in the ancestry until i feel the anesthesia kind of fades and and the energy can flow more and nourish my body from below so that the, the ground sends more energy into my body you know somewhere on my desk here and with my typical add fashion my desk is way too disorganized for me to find anything but um <laughs> there's a, there's the nub there's a wooden nub of a pen that my grandfather used to use and uh, my grandfather died in Auschwitz uh, when I was five months of age. And I saw him once, or he saw me once. I don't know if I ever saw him. And it um, turns out he was a physician and a writer. And guess what? I become a physician and a writer. I can't think it can't be accidental, you know? That's right. Maybe I should hang out with this. And, 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 and on the pen, there is... You know, he used to bite the pen. This is an ink, you know, pen where you, there's the there's a pen holder and then you put the the blade into it or whatever you write with the tip of the pen and then you dip it in ink and he would chew on the wood. So I got this teeth mark on this. You know, maybe I should wow. hang out with that pen a bit more. 
Yeah. That's right. That's let me ask you. Let me ask you about. Let me ask you about collective trauma. Um, <clears throat> so you work with collective trauma, but the people that come to your workshops are coming with the intention and um, that trauma is somewhat in the trauma is very alive for them, but it's a therapeutic community. I imagine that you work with now. I sometimes go into other situations as I did, you know, when I was in Palestine last year, somebody told me that there's no post-traumatic stress disorder here because the trauma is never post. Because there's an ongoing conflict, as you know, and ongoing people are being hurt and, and you know, I don't need to go into the politics of it. Or I'll be going to, in a, this later this month, or early next month to the former Yugoslavia, to Ljubljana and Belgrade and Sarajevo, where there's so much hurt that people have done to each other. And whether it's not even been acknowledged yet, um, or if I go into these indigenous communities as I do in Canada, it's not just that stuff happened to them in the past, it's that the system continues to oppress them and continues to impose pain on them. Have you worked with situations like that? Yeah, yeah, we have, we have, um, we have, you know, also our NGO is working with a lot of what we call in our work hot trauma, like trauma, there is no post because it's all the time. I'm going, so, it's so, how do you, so I'm curious how you address that. And um, yeah, how do you address that? Yeah, I think the first thing is, I think most probably what you also do is first, the acknowledgement that there yeah. is a lot of trauma is like somebody needs to even if it sounds ridiculous at the beginning because it seems so obvious but if somebody comes and witnesses what happens or what happened with an open heart and there's yeah. acknowledgement there's an immediate sense of i feel seen not because of course we we see each other but the, the like a deeper witnessing I'm talking about creates like a sense of safety. And then I think that's that sense of safety within very unsafe environments are the beginning of being able to create some sort of resourcing together. And then if we use that space mm -hmm. where we have a certain amount of trust and some, and I'm talking about a little bit of safety within an unsafe space, yeah. we can accumulate energy yeah. and create some soil and like some grounding and some embodiment. And then from that, we keep on building like in the right architecture, we keep on building more soil and the more soil and emotional recognition we have. So I often say the body is the soil, the emotion is the water, the mind is the seed and the sun, the soul or the mm -hmm. light is the sun. And if we want to grow something somewhere, we need to create a little bit of soil that becomes fertile through the emotional health or the emotional restoration yes. in order to plant new seeds, to build something new. And, and I think when you go, especially also as a white person, and you go to these different places, there is a recognition of, yes, we, I see you kind of using your own privilege as a commitment to not turn away because that's mm. what our privilege can easily provide us to say, I don't want to deal with this too much, but yeah. I see you continuously going towards. And I think that's an amazing invitation to create more safety, to feel seen. And, and then I think we need to develop collective technologies, how to create architectures, holding spaces where that can grow like incubators for these spaces so that and then how people in in societies can pass that on to other people and i think that that process is really beautiful and i'm i'm sure there's a lot of indigenous wisdom anyway that does that we just need to provide the circumstances and stop the re-traumatization wherever we can that's super important too uh, of course I, I usually end my workshops with indigenous people by asking them to connect with their own traditions and there's so much beautiful healing as a matter of fact you know i'm sure you feel the same way <clears throat> but sometimes i think my god 
never mind, it would be great for the indigenous people to reconnect with their traditions. It'd be so great for the rest of society if we could actually absorb some of those traditions. Mm. Yeah, and I think a lot of the mystical knowledge is deeply rooted also in the, in the indigenous traditions. And yeah. I completely agree with you, yeah. Now, I want to ask you about something else. We've touched upon it. Well, two things. Something when you talk about body and mind and so on, it reminded me of your three sync method. Mm -hmm. I think, did you come up with that phrase? Yeah, yeah. Congratulations. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and sync, I think, is being in sync, being synchronized. Mm -hmm. And um, it, might, it might be very nice for people if you describe what you mean by that three sync mm -hmm. method. But it's so mm -hmm. elegant and it's so simple and it's not difficult to practice if one, if one remembers it. Exactly, you're right. If you if you remember it, and maybe I will talk a little bit about it, and whoever feels invited can immediately also connect yeah. to it. So then it's then we are having a moment to do the practice because I think we can do it in a short time or in a long time. But let's do the short version. So the first step is always that my breath is one of my best friends is there from the beginning of my life is wired in my entire nervous system so using the breath as an anchor to connect to my body sensations so i exhale maybe i slow down a bit the way i exhale and i i drop into my body and see just to notice is my body tense is my body open where do i feel most of my aliveness right now where does it feel more numb or distant and I just get an impression of my the state of my physical body. Also, when we are stressed, it's harder for us to ground ourselves. When we can relax more, we naturally gravitate towards the ground and feel the connection to the soil, we feel a bit more space. So I can use my breath and with a few cycles of breathing, I can feel my body and notice different parts without rejecting anything that I find just to notice and I don't need to change anything and and I often refer to the body as this this is the cup and then when when I feel that cup and I have enough access then I connect to okay I ask myself what's my emotional what's my emotional state and and then I can see if I can name an emotion right now. I mm -hmm. feel a little bit of joy. Sometimes emotions are strong, but sometimes they are subtle, like a bit. And, and or I notice, I ask myself, but I can't actually name any emotion. So then I just notice that I'm a bit overwhelmed or numb, and that's equally fine. So then I connect my body my emotional experience that's why we call it sync see if it's synchronized if it's disconnected and then i notice my mental activities my mind right now more like very busy and tense is my mind open spacious creative um, relaxed calm so I notice my mental activity and like that, I create a connection between my body, physical body, the part of my nervous system that encodes for that, my emotional experience, my mental experience. And then I can see either how do I feel related to the environment or how do I feel related to yoga right now? And is there relational flow? Do I feel a bit withdrawn? I, I just allow that, however it is. And if I want to, I can uh, also notice what in me is at all aware of all this information. So what's mm -hmm. what's the awareness in, in all of that information? And so, as you said, we can, whenever we remember that, even for a minute, we can check in with ourselves. So I can do it as a 10 minute meditation in the morning. It's, I think it has a synchronizing effect in, if we do it regularly. Uh, you know, it reminds me um, of the Buddhist sense of the four foundations of mindfulness, the, the body in the body and the feelings in the feelings and, and the 
the mental formations, and then also the, the consciousness, which is the last thing that you mentioned, mm -hmm. being aware of yourself, being aware. Mm -hmm. um, your book is about attunement, and um, you quote, I think I mentioned before, Dan Siegel as being attuned to the internal experience of another person. Um, <clears throat> it was from Dan Siegel that I heard the following experiment, and he he doesn't remember this, but he, he gave some lectures in Seattle. And I, long before I knew him, I came to hear these lectures back in, in the 1990s. Boy, we're getting old. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he talked about it, the double TV experiment where the kids were interacting on a closed circuit television with their mothers. And the child would make a face and the mother would, you know, mirror the face and funny movements and the kids were very happy then they turn the tv off then they turn off the live feed and they re they're in different rooms and they replayed for the child the same image of the mother being loving and humorous and playful and the children got so upset mm. because there was no attunement mm. that's beautiful and and in your book, it's, they call it the double TV experiment. And in your book, Attuned, you talk about brain synchronicity. Now, can you talk about that? Mm. Yeah, it's exactly like when, when, for example, when I look at you and you look at me, we have, like, I have you in me, the Gabor that I see happens in my nervous system. So when I consciously connect to you in me like i feel you here but i also know that the gabor i see is coded in my perception so then there is a, a tremendous intimacy and so when you give a talk like you said then thousand people have a gabor inside of their nervous system that's pretty intimate so that and then you exist obviously in your body also but you exist i believe in everybody that sees you giving a talk or a lecture as energy as a wave pattern in every brain so and i believe our our existence is not just one or the other it's all of it yeah. and that's that's really so we're existing as all of that and that's why you what you said when the mothers were really there so even through Zoom, when I sit here with you, I, I can feel you as if you were sitting in the same room. Mm. And, and that, that has an effect. And that's why I think what you just described, that even if we connect to somebody on the other side of the planet, in our nervous systems, we are deeply connected. And that gives a sense of intimacy, closeness, co-regulation, mm. and for people, and there are many people nowadays that do also deep trauma work online. So there's a deep sense of attunement. And when we train attunement, so we can perceive each other very deeply and precisely, also in, in former levels of development, in ancestries, in our collective past. And I think that's a very powerful process. And it also says, well, we can, we actually have access to such an amazing attunement as societies. We can begin to learn to embrace polarization, people that we don't agree with. Like, like there's so much more to learn about collective attunement and how the collective body can become a vessel for all this fragmentation that we see right now in the world. So I think that's an exciting process, exactly, exactly what you said. And that our we are not just limited to our brains, but actually there's such a, a field available to us of information. You know, there was another study that I read a couple of years ago. It was done in therapeutic sessions with a client and a therapist. And as you know, and, and you actually talk about the heart and mind connection, that the heart emits certain in, um, electrical waves and so does the brain. And when they're in sync, we experience the kind of openness and the joy and, and, and you know, a presence. And presence is something you talk about quite a bit in the book, presencing, I really like that phrase that you use. Uh, so in this study, they, they were measuring the, these waves in both client and therapist. And there's certain moments when the therapist 
brain waves were in sync with their heart with their heart emissions and so were the clients and later on although the therapist and the client didn't know when the study showed that when because they weren't monitoring their own waves but when they both experienced the synchronicity between brain and heart that's when they both felt most connected to each other mm -hmm. and uh, the interesting thing was from the therapeutic point of view this tend to happen more when the therapist was listening than when they were talking <laughs> so, so so we think here we are with our great wisdom and our great uh, insights and so on that's not when the connection happens that's right yeah this says a lot about the power of listening and the tuning and holding a space but it, yeah that's beautiful what you said very lovely yeah yeah um let me just look at my notes here there's so many of them oh yeah i love your formulation about the three innate and inalienable human rights and you talk about being and becoming and belonging i had not seen that formulation before either do you want to expand on that mm -hmm. yeah i will expand on that and then maybe we can also include some of the questions that people wrote in there's a sure. questions to both of us yeah i think that um like in my work and also of course extracted from the mystical principles that are around for thousands of years so this is nothing new in that sense is that i think space or consciousness which is being leads to an emergence of becoming is energy flow is purpose is creativity is expression and and energy needs to cast itself into fluid structures so it builds structures, habits, bodies, organs, societies, um, that it flows through. It's like the pipe system. And yeah. so I believe also on the level of human rights that everybody has a right to be. And nobody has the right to take that being in life from somebody else. So we need to preserve the right to live and, and, and provide safety and and protect in a way life for everybody so that in itself is already like an, an important practice given what we see right now in our world and then the right to become what if we lived a life when we gave everything that everybody around us uh, can live a life of expression of purpose of creativity and whenever I'm in, in connection with you, that I care for your highest expression, that yeah. that's, what I, that's what my love and my blessing goes towards, that when you are at your best, you're giving to the world more of what's needed, and that enlarges our world. And if we all live like this, we create the world of generosity versus a world of scarcity where we try to put each other down. And, and so the, the right to become and to flourish and to see what we need to flourish with each other. And how would organizations look like if that's the way how we supported each other? And, and then the, 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 the third one is the right to belong, like that we support everybody's belonging to a healthy social network and healthy ecosystem. We build healthy ecosystems through the way we live and we, we walk our talk. And so these three together, I think cover a lot of what we would call human rights because they fit to one of these uh, these buckets, and I think they also they also express very much the deepest needs that we have as souls living this life and going through this experience, and that it's it's a human right as much as it's a human responsibility. Like yeah. it's both. Yeah. Well, thank you for that formulation. Yeah, that's beautiful, Gabor. Thank you. And such like deep dialogue. I love our dialogues. Every time I see you, I feel so much in resonance. And and also with your book, the the I love so much how much you look at the collective dimension as well and how much yeah. you care for the collective space and how much you walk towards it and you give yourself with your own vulnerability and learning. So that's a really precious quality of yours that I highly honor in you. Thank you. Likewise, uh, I, I know we're going to come to questions now from the audience. Let me just take 30 seconds to read you a quote that I think you'll love. 
um, and, and it sums up so much about both what you and I are working at in this world. And this is from a book called The Course of Storms by Susan Griffin. And she writes the story, of, and, 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 and this is so much um, mirrored in, in this book of yours, Attuned. She says, the story of one life cannot be told separately from the story of other lives. Who are we? The question is not simple. What we call the self is part of a large matrix of relation, a larger matrix of relationship and society. Had we been born to a different family in a different time to a different world, we would not be the same. All the lives that surround us are in us. Mm. Very much so. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, and uh, I, Digo, uh, we had some lots of questions come in. I think we tried to collect some of the themes and, and crystallize some questions, and then maybe we have time for one or two live questions. Yeah, we did have uh, several questions come in, and but you know, thank you, Thomas and Gabber, for having your dialogue today. So. Again, these questions were submitted before and some have come in today. So let's start with this first question from Deborah. Why do you think there is not a stronger focus on collective, community-based approaches to healing rather than the more individually focused counseling approaches? Hmm. You want to start, Gabor? I'll give a very quick answer. Um, it's that um, pretty much in, in line with this idea that we're part of a matrix, um, many of our ideologies and approaches reflect the ideology of the mainstream society. Now, the fundamental ideology of a capitalist colonial society is that people, individuals separated from others that were basically aggressive, selfish creatures. And... Uh, even taking away the aggression and the selfishness, the concept of individualism as distinct from the collective experience that Thomas and I have been talking about infects everything. It, it affects how we practice medicine, <clears throat> and it, psychiatry, and it also affects uh, therapy very often. And so that in a society that's ideologically dedicated to the separate soul self in a phrase of Dan Siegel, uh, you're gonna get individual approaches ignoring the collective. That would be my quick mm. response to that. Mm. Yeah, I resonate very much with it. And, and I think that we are slowly waking up that individualism or hyper-individualism is not, not the answer to our problems and more uh, also part of the root cause and the trauma kind of cements that version a bit that we feel separate <laughs> and and pretty much as you said Gabor that uh, I think we are also through technology and through the evolution that we have pressing collective issues forced in a way by life or invited by life depends uh, if we voluntarily sign up for it to develop more of a collective sense and sensing and the more we develop it, we actually melt part. It's not that the self doesn't exist. Of course, the self develops, but there is a, a wider space that we, I think, are on the verge of inhabiting more. And that, that's going to create a very good balance. And uh, uh, everything else you said, I think, is very, very on. Uh, I resonate with that. I like your sense of optimism here because actually it is changing. I mean, you know, this book of yours, my book, Dan Siegel's book, Interconnected. Uh, you quote Stephen Borges' work of social engagement in, in your book, Attuned. <clears throat> There's just so much more awareness now so that this collective sense, as you suggest, is actually growing. And I think we can see that as a very positive development. Mm -hmm. right. Great, thank you. Um... Still a couple more. Uh, several people asked a similar question. Is it possible to attune to someone when they are not able or not available to be in connection? For example, someone estranged, in crisis, does not have capacity for relational attunement? 
Yeah, maybe I'll jump in here. So I think this relates very much to what, what I shared before about the experience of the child. Uh, like when we are, whatever is the state that seems like to absorb the, the relational capacity and, and feels like isolating, depressing, depleting, like withdrawn, whatever. It's, of course, as we said before, like when we carry each other inside, there's always a possibility to attune. It might not always feel comfortable and it, it challenges us to expand our capacity and to be willing to feel also a certain amount of discomfort. And often when somebody doesn't want to relate to us, we go through a process ourselves. We feel rejected, we feel not liked, we take it personal, we think. So there's a lot I think we also need to work through when that happens in our lives. But I think that that's an amazing process of maturation like that I can hold a deeper presence in my life for the things that I like and the people that I agree with, but also for everybody else. And that's much more challenging because there I, I will meet my own exclusion and where the world cannot land in me. And I believe one aspect of wisdom is how much of the world can land in me because that makes me wiser, more fluid, more able to navigate in a bigger part of the world. And I would say um, it's a journey of maturation, the question to be able to host that inside. But I want to also make it too long to listen to you, Gabor. Well, um, everything you said, yes. I would only add, if you don't take response, and, and, and your book talks about responsibility quite a bit, the ability to respond. Mm -hmm. And if I make my own capacity to attune with you, dependent on you that means i'm not free <clears throat> so whether i choose to attune or to work at attunement because i'm trying to help you or the, the bigger reason i would say the more immediate reason is so i can liberate myself i don't want to be dependent on you from a from my capacity to attune and so it's as much as a act of meta loving kindness to the other as it is an act of loving kindness to myself if i pay attention to my attunement whether or not you respond the way i'd like you to beautiful yeah. great i'd like to get a to a couple of questions that have come in during this call um so amitola asks i believe attunement leads to liberation Yet, as a Black woman living in the American experiment, I wonder how one can feel safe attuning within a world that consistently demonstrates danger and causes trauma. Maybe you want to go first this time, Gabor? Yeah, sure. I would only say that it's a real challenge what you're posing here. And as a Black person in the U.S., um, it's difficult to find safety in the external environment. That's the nature of the system. That's the nature of a system that actually still denies your history. Um, but we're talking about liberation on two different levels. There's liberation on the political social level. And that's, that's an ongoing struggle in the US as it is in so many countries around the world. But then there's liberation in the personal sense. And that is available to you. Even as the process of social and political liberation is an ongoing challenge and a struggle. Um, you know, I've had communication from black men in death row prisons in the United States who have liberated themselves they're still appealing that death sentence that may or may not win their appeal, but they're liberated. And you can tell because I have videos of them. So I'm not saying I could do it. I'm not saying it's easy. It was a difficult process for them. A lot of awareness, a lot of mindfulness, a lot of trauma work. But they're as free as anybody I've ever seen. That's what I would say. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Gabor. And uh, maybe just to honor also that uh, I or maybe we uh, do not have your experience and uh, in that sense. So I think it's also we are speaking or tuning in from a place that lacks a certain experience and we are or I'm learning also from you as a black woman how your life is and that informs me so i want to respect that also and um and and i and i agree like i think attunement is also a way that i i attune to myself and see what do i need in order to to develop or create a deeper safety in myself what are the ingredients that I need? What are the supportive relationships in my life? What is nature doing? What is music or art doing for me in order to create a sense of resourcing in myself? So it's important to build that capacity also like to change my own fear inside with the, with the support of people that I trust in my community or with professionals to create more safety. And that enables me to tune in more with the environment, with people in my ecosystem, and and also develop the resilience. And I think Gabo, you spoke already beautifully to that, so I don't need to repeat this again. So yeah, that may be just a short addition. Thank you both. And I'd like to ask one more question um, before we get into further details and close out our session today um, from Jack. Could you speak a bit about the time it takes to clear personal trauma and the urgency of the times we live in? Can we attune and live in a way that contributes to collective healing while our own trauma is not yet fully cleared? Thomas, yeah. I'll, let you answer, I'll let you answer this in detail, but I'm just gonna quickly say, if I waited, uh, to do my work in the world until my tone was totally cleared, I'd still be waiting. So uh, there's no contradiction. But Thomas, let 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 let's have you answer that. No, I was I was going to say something similar. I think um, let's look at for a moment. Trauma says in the traumatic moment when something overwhelming <laughs> happens, and the trauma response says in a way here in space and time, it's not good for me. I think that's very important. Like trauma lives from the fact that dispersing space and time is needed in order to survive better. Like shutting something down, creating a split, creating two-ness, uh, creating past and future is the way how trauma affects our nervous systems or is the response in our nervous system. So that means also in the healing work, I often say because people come to our groups and say, how long do I still need to work on this? So if I were ever to answer that question as the question that is a question about time, but the question only says, it's hard here for me. And I want to honor that it is hard sometimes for us to be here. It is. But let's hear that we are not talking about time. We are talking about what is. And so if we can turn any question about development, like how long is it going to take into what's actually hard to experience here, then even the, the way of how much do I have to heal needs to be brought back to what's actually difficult for me here. And the second step, of course, for some people, the trauma of fragmentation is so overwhelming when we come in contact with the world that we need safe healing spaces. And to focus on one's individual healing for some time is essential, important, and creates the basis to interact with the world. But as Gabor said, I think if anybody that does something in the world would wait for until we are healed, it's I think once we feel enough grounded and safe and uh, integrated that we can provide spaces of listening, interacting, responsible action in the world so that we can stay related to the world with what we do. Then I think the, the journey of, of having collective impact 
becomes our healing journey that actually is needed to help us to grow more. And I'm sure, Gabor, a, a lot of the work that you did taught you, I'm sure, because it's uh, happened, I think, to everybody I know. And so that's why the interaction with the world becomes our teacher, I believe. But maybe you want to add something to that. And Gabor, we've lost your audio there, if you can still hear us. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'll only add my little joke, my standard little joke here that um, your work evoked for me, your words evoked for me. And I often say this, that um, I'm 79 years old now, and I would not want to be as young and stupid as I was when I was 78, you know, so that, yes, the work does instruct us and we grow from it and and it goes back to your concept really thomas of social mysticism or relational mysticism that even that work that we do help us helps us to grow and so you can't stay away from it at at a certain point inside you inside me inside other people listening there was a knowing that i'm ready now to speak to the world i may not be perfect i may have a lot more to learn which is the only attitude to take, by the way, at any stage. But I'm ready to share something of myself of what I've learned in order to help others. And I think once you're ready to do that, as you suggest, Thomas, the growth will be further fertilized by by your work. Beautiful. I, I want to underline also what you just said is like the only important part in, in that going out into the world is that I'm willing to bow down Every time I, need, I, I see that I run into difficulties and I, there's a lovely, a lovely part in the Tao Te Ching that Stephen Mitchell translated. It says, when the master runs into difficulties, she stops and gives herself to it. And I think whatever we do in the world, if we can stop and give ourselves to the difficulties, we are committed to eternal learning. And we don't ask anymore how long it's going to take, because every time we learn something, let's say, thank you for the blessing. And, and keep on walking. And uh, I want to underline how important it is to, to be able to learn from life whenever we run into something that's actually our teaching. And I think that's so precious. Amen. <laughs> thank you, Thomas. And thank you, Gabor. I know, Thomas, you wanted to share a prayer from your book. And I'd also like to invite any last words of wisdom or any else thing you'd like to say before I get into a few details about Thomas's new book, Attuned. So maybe I will read the, a short part of the prayer in the book, and then maybe, Gabor, you can leave us with some uh, words uh, of yours for, to finish our conversation. Um, in the book, there are two sections, short sections that I, I like very much. Love is at the center of it all. It is the root and heart, the foundation and the fire. It is the source of our deepest longing to connect and relate, to grow and to heal, to be and become and belong. These are the simplest, most essential ingredients of healing relation and are also its product, the higher capacities afforded to us as a result of shared healing. And the second one, may we awaken new pathways of attuned relation and healing integration. May we mature into a new story of being, becoming, and belonging. May we lean courageously into the scintillating light of our evolutionary future and find ourselves already always whole. Oh. And maybe with this beautiful kind of prayer invocation or reminders, I want also to thank uh, Julie Jordan Averitt that helped me uh, very essentially also to write this book and was an integral part of it. 
I want to thank you, Julie. I don't know if she, if you're listening right now or you will hear it in the recording. And uh, so our collaboration is very precious to me and it's beautiful. So a lot of thanks and gratitude to you for being a partner in this endeavor, in this beautiful endeavor. And um, yeah, so thank you, Julie. And back to you, Gabor. Um, if there's anything you want to leave us with, You know, uh, Thomas, I'll read this, something from your book. By the way, I'll also acknowledge my son, Daniel, who helped me write my book. And mm -hmm. really, I could not have done it without him. So it's so important to um, recognize that we didn't do this all by ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, um, I think um, we could truthfully say about each other as well, one another here, is that we both influenced one another's work in a very positive way. Um, mm -hmm. That's Thank you for that. Let me just quote you from your book, okay? This you just talked about love and this beautiful phrase of Thomas Merton's that you cite in uh, the beginning of chapter seven of your book, where you say that love is our true destiny. We do not find meaning by ourselves alone; we find it with one another. Thank you. Thank you, that's really beautiful. And thank you for joining me here today. And uh, it's a gift and it's true. We, I think there's a lot of positive inspiration mutually and thank you for that. And I always say like in you, I found a brother that is deeply committed to the collective dimension also. And it's beautiful to share that space with you. So thank you. And thank you both. Our deep gratitude for you, Thomas, of course, Gabor for joining us today for a wonderful conversation. You're sharing your wisdom today and your acknowledgement. So it was nice to hear how the pieces fit. I want to also thank all of our viewers today. Thank you for your presence. And before we go, I'd like to share a few details about Thomas's book. The book is available to purchase in three different formats, including hardcover, audio, and Kindle format. You'll find the links to various booksellers on the webpage attunedbook.com. If you're ordering outside the U.S., please check with your preferred retailer or the Amazon site in your country. A German translation will be published on September 20th. If you order a copy now, you'll also receive two free gifts, including a relational attunement audio practice from Thomas. And again, all the information is on the webpage, attunedbook.com. You're also invited to join Thomas and Gabor for a free at the upcoming Collective Trauma Summit, which begins September 26. This is a free online event that includes over 60 speakers. Visit the website collectivetraumasummit.com. And again, we hope you enjoy the book. Thank you again for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you in the future. Bye for now. And uh, Digo, I also want to thank Sounds True for the amazing collaboration. That uh, Sounds True is. Uh, dear to my heart and uh, like a very lovely partner in that. So thank you too. Great, great, great. Till next time, everybody. Bye for now. <laughs>